So last time we had uh, talked briefly, or not last time, but several times ago, about uh, thermal expansion problems uh, in dissimilar metal bonding. And here's a little table that I found in my notes. Um, aluminum alloys are about 2 times 10 to the minus 5. This is in 10 to the minus 6 per degree Kelvin. So 2 to the minus 5, 2 times 10 to the minus 5 per degree C, per degree Kelvin, whichever. And most metals are in that range. Some of the cast irons are only half of that. Titanium alloys are only half of that. Um, there are some tungsten molybdenum alloys that are um, very low, uh, but they melt at high temperatures. And in fact, they're similar to some of the ceramics. In fact, silicon is somewhere around this six. And so if we're talking about dye attach for ceramics, uh, they sometimes make copper tungsten composites to try to match the coefficient of thermal expansion of silicon. Uh, very expensive, very heavy. Um, there's a company that makes aluminum uh, silicon carbide composites that have like 60 volume percent silicon carbide in, in 40 volume percent aluminum. And the only way you can do that with powders, because if you just took around powders and had them as perfect packing density, I think you only get something like 60% and you'll never get perfect packing density. They actually go with a double, double size powder, dual size powder. So they're not circular powders, but if you just consider circular powders, you can say what's the largest particle that will fit between the spheres, actually you should be doing a tetrahedron here, right? Three dimensional, but nonetheless, they actually have a bimodal size distribution where, and you can calculate, I think this is 0.16 times the diameter of the larger particle or something like that. So they actually mix them together like that so they can get maximum packing density. Um, to match the coefficient of thermal expansion, not quite as important in silicon, because silicon is not terribly brittle, but gallium arsenide, like on your cell phones and stuff, which they need for the higher frequency of cell phone operation, gallium arsenide will crack just from bonding even at room temperature. You don't have to worry about the thermal cycling and stuff. So they actually have to use things like these aluminum silicon carbide uh, substrates for dissimilar material bonding uh, as far as that goes. Diamond silica, uh, this is quartz, diamond and quartz and carbon fibers can be in order, in order of magnitude or more smaller. There are some low expansion what we call invar alloys, invar for invariant, meaning uh, low coefficient of thermal expansion. And they're down <coughs> in this range too. Fairly pricey, they're high in nickel and molybdenum as I remember, and molybdenum is very expensive. But in any case, um, there's about um, two and a half orders of magnitude. What's a half order of magnitude? It's three, because 3.16 squared is 10. Okay, or the square root of 10 is three, roughly, uh, 3.16. So on the geometric scale, three is half an order of magnitude, okay? Uh, but in any case, you've got two and a half orders of magnitude from one to 300 here. Um, it's interesting that rubbers have the highest coefficients of thermal expansion of any material that we deal with. So that's one of the major problems in dissimilar metal bonding. Another thing I, I mentioned was the problem, this is several lectures ago, of trying to do cold bonding of some of these integrated circuits in the old days, um, or uh, transistors and, and whatnot. So here we have, so here's a, this is a, a power transistor. Here's a silicon chip on a copper substrate. It's threaded into a base and it's got a lead coming off that's soldered on here, and we might talk about that later. Here's another power electronics component. You got some, I don't even know what this one is, but uh, um, you got some heavy copper pieces and some leads coming in here to whatever this uh, active component is. And I mentioned that in order to encapsulate these things, 
in the old days and even today sometimes they would use indium this is when we were talking about cold pressure welding and I told you that indium had the highest oxide to metal hardness ratio and therefore you could form a cold bond so this would be the lid of one of these packages which might look something like this this is this one is actually not bonded that way this is just a big diode this is like a thousand amp diode okay so it's got a big piece of PN silicon inside and big copper bases and here's the external lead coming in but you have to seal that from the environment because the the contacts inside will otherwise corrode you got a lot of dissimilar materials and you get galvanic corrosion this is a uh, one kilowatt transistor okay so um, it's actually got three leads you got a lead here a lead here and a lead here you can tell which ones are the high current leads compared to the low current uh, uh, emitter uh, but in any case you have to make these bonds and some of these bonds you can make because it's complex in packaging all this together some of them can be braze joints some can be solder joints some of them may need to be a cold joint in which case you basically would have your substrate um, you might have a lid in this case they're actually showing a electrical resistance weld this is the lid of the can here's your silicon in here and you're actually going to come down here and squeeze and pass current through here and make a uh, resistant spot weld which later looks like this okay there it's a nickel plated mild steel well and they they really didn't make a weld they still got the nickel there but nonetheless it's sort of actually sort of a diffusion bond it's sort of an activated diffusion bond if you will okay nickel plate to keep the iron from oxidizing and here's your activated bond you end up with two nickel surfaces which are just cold pressure forging together um, here's another version of cold pressure welding for aluminum copper packages aluminum copper don't really weld well because they form intermetallics again your lid you've got some sort of components in here you put a little projection on here you come in with force in this case it's just force you see the rounded electrode why do we have a rounded tip electrode to get the shear at the interface right I've got a I got to get shear interfacial sliding to extrude out or slide out that those impurities and there's what the joint looks like you can see the projection was probably this width and it's been folded over and there's your real bond in here this is not quite as good a bond over here because it didn't get lots of shear uh, and here's another one I don't know if I can show this one very oh well I can show it without messing up the picture but essentially you have some electrodes and you uh, this is a uh, ultrasonic I think uh, actually it's a resistant seam weld but you can do it ultrasonically too and when you're all done you end up with a bond that looks like this okay um, there's what's at the interface here um, nickel iron cobalt lid to package wall joint uh, produced by series electrodes so they're heating it up the nickel iron cobalt is basically the invar alloy uh, the low coefficient of thermal expansion alloy uh, they also sometimes do micro arc welding there's a little micro arc weld uh, on these things and hopefully you have room that you don't heat up the whole thing and destroy your semiconductor while you're doing that so anyway there's lots of different ways but indium is one of those that can be easily um, cold welded so okay any questions we've been talking about soldering those are just kind of cleaning up some some things <coughs> um, we've been talking about cold welding we talked about Young's equation there are several uh, things we ought to talk about uh, in terms of wetting you need to get wetting the whole soldering and brazing process occurs because metals have high surface energy okay they have higher surface energy than any other material by a factor of two or three remember that's because you have bonding from several layers deep 
whereas covalent and ionic it's really just the top surface layer of atoms. Metals it's the top two or three surface layers and so you get surface energy contribution from like three times the volume of, of material. Well that means if you can get a liquid metal to wet a solid metal by cleaning the contamination you will have a very low interfacial energy because what you end up with is you start out with the solid metal which could be copper it could be anything else and you'll put a drop of a liquid metal on top and you want it to flow across the surface by Young's equation except Young's equation only occurs at equilibrium but that's why it's hard to understand it but the way you'll get an interfacial energy here between the liquid and the solid that's this interfacial energy here will be very low because you got metal metal bonds and metal metals like to satisfy each other's bonds that gives you a low effective surface energy and the, the ceramic fluxes or the organic fluxes have higher interfacial energies and that's why the metal wants to undermine them and flow across underneath them. The metal's heavy compared to these organics or the molten ceramic fluxes. You don't use barium chloride as a flux because it can be heavier than some of your metals. But you use uh, fluxes that are light and will be displaced by surface tension um, and the cleaning action of the flux. So that's why soldering and brazing work. I'm not saying there aren't soldering and brazing processes for ceramics, there are, but they're actually where you actually get a chemical reaction between the metal and the ceramic that gives you a very low interfacial energy. There are not really soldering operations for uh, ceramics. If you can come up with a ceramic solder, the world would be the path to your door. But in fact, because soldering occurs below 450 degrees centigrade, you don't have as much thermal energy to drive these reactions. In brazing, you can go up to 1,000 degrees, and you now can have reactive metal components like, well, um, we've worked and other people have worked on trying to come up with a solder which might be tin and titanium. So it might be 95 tin and 5% titanium, okay? And that will be reactive because the titanium forms the titanium oxide with the ceramic, okay? But in fact, you have to go to pretty high temperatures, well above the melting point of the tin to do this. In fact, you have to go up to like 600 C usually, which is really in the brazing range, even though you're ending up with a joint that has a melting point in the soldering range. So you have to have that extra temperature to drive the chemical reactions to get things started where the titanium is going to react with the ceramic. So you can get a reactive wetting um, by forming compounds at the surface. Um, and in fact, well, I'll show you some of that later. I want to talk a little bit about the requirements of a flux and then give you some examples. <coughs> Uh, someday maybe I'll find some book that, uh, or some handouts that will allow you to see some of this. But you have to have chemical activity in your flux. This is requirements of flux. It has to be able to react with the surface. And the next one is has to have spreading activity. The third has to have thermal stability. And the fourth, it should be non-corrosive. at least in the environment it's going to serve. So these are four requirements of your flux if you're going to be doing soldering and some of these are written very specifically into some military soldering specs for military hardware and electronics. So the first example that I'll give you is oxalic acid. Uh, 
it turns out that if I want to use lead tin solder, and the eutectic here is 183C, and it's um, 37 lead and 6310 is the alloy. If you use oxalic acid, you just take a piece of copper, take a torch underneath it to heat it up, put a little, a little solder um, on the surface and you put oxalic acid as the flux on top, you'll find as you heat it up the oxalic acid will start to, start to boil. And then you will see just as you get to about 183, the solder starts to melt and it starts to flow, but it doesn't get very far. It just stops. It's got a good contact angle, but the problem is oxalic acid boils at 182C. So this is a problem of thermal stability. The oxalic acid uh, is an acid. It'll clean off the copper oxides. Remember I showed you the wetting test. Freshly clean copper, you can get it to flow within less than a second. Well, the flux here will clean it, but then it vaporizes off at the same time. It's starting to do its cleaning action, and so it just doesn't stick around to finish the job. So oxalic acid doesn't work. Another one is glucose. Good old sugar. Okay, acts as a flux. And it will, it can um, um, remove some of the copper tarnish, but no spreading. It will essentially, and this one I probably could, you take a copper plate and you'll have your glucose and you'll have your lead tin on copper and I probably ought to be able to develop one of these but supposedly you heat this whole thing up you get to the melting point of lead tin the lead tin balls up and you can take that little lead tin ball and run it around the surface but it has no good contact angle and so it just remains as a ball and you'll have a little track if you take that little ball and you run it around the surface of the copper you can make a little line of tinned lead copper without the lead tin spreading out so this has a pro proper problem of no spreading activity so if I'm talking about the requirements of the flux I've got oxalic acid has no thermal stability glucose has no spreading ability and the last one is abetic acid has anyone ever heard of abetic acid before? okay abetic acid is an organic acid and it's got a chemical formula that looks terrible okay it's <coughs> three benzene rings with a bunch, you know, I can't even tell you. I'm not enough of an organic chem chemist to tell you. Well, here, I can put it up here. It looks something like that. Okay? That's abetic acid. So, I can't even tell you <coughs> uh, um, exactly what types of, of bonds those are. Abetic acid actually um, is fairly good in a lot, of, a lot of ways. If it's fairly clean copper, you will wet the whole surface quite well and you'll get a good solder joint um, but sometimes if you're tarnish uh, low tarnish this is okay as a as a flux high tarnish on your copper it's just no good because abetic acid will form a copper abetic, so you actually clean the surface of the copper oxide.
but it can't be very it's not a very strong acid it's used in printing inks don't ask me why but it's often used in printing inks um, but at high tarnish there's not enough activity to clean the surface so if I go back to my requirements of the flux that it have chemical activity it doesn't have enough chemical activity but if you add just the least little bit of hydrochloric acid to this it'll wet beautifully and in fact this is the basis of all the rosin based fluxes what's rosin anybody know pine pine tar tap so if you go down to Georgia and you go out walking in the forest it's a pine forest and you look at the trees and there's this little kind of gold colored material dripping down on the outside of the bark of the trees it's called rosin it's the tar or the the juice the blood of the tree or whatever you want to call it and you there's a number of uses for rosin you can bake potatoes in it. it makes the best baked potatoes go to Texas Roadhouse you can tell the different texture if you if you <coughs> well when I was growing up in Atlanta the next door neighbor used to rosin baked potatoes on the weekends okay he had a vat of rosin he'd wrap everything in aluminum foil he'd put the potato in there and you get this nice fluffy mashed potato as long as the aluminum foil is nice and tight and you don't get a rosin tasting potato um, it turns out you can do just as well by just having a vat of hot oil and french frying the whole potato and you don't even have to wrap it in aluminum foil uh, you just throw it you clean the clean the surface you know throw it in the oil and it will sink to the bottom and when it pops to the top it's done now it might take 40 minutes to french fry a whole potato but you take that and you open that up and you put the butter on it it just melts right through there it's a nice fluffy potato go to Texas Roadhouse look at the skin of the baked potato it's a little different because it's french fried okay I made about 20 pounds of rosin baked potatoes for Thanksgiving last year okay uh, not rosin baked I did oil baked I was frying turkeys so I f figured hey before I fried the turkey I'd fry some potatoes so anyway um, a betic acid has the ability to eat off some copper oxide it has a wonderful surface uh, angle it spreads well it has thermal stability it doesn't have enough chemical activity if you add a little bit of hydrochloric acid to it or an amine hydrochloride it can be an organic chloride just a little bit of chlorine will replace that copper oxide with a copper chloride which then dissolves in the betic acid rosin flux so um, what they what they uh, talk about in the soldering literature uh, it may say <clears throat> that you will flux your circuit board with water white rosin now that little gold stuff coming down the tree is gold because it's got all kinds of junk in it okay but if you distill your rosin you can get what's called water white and water white actually still is somewhat gold but if you drop it into a bath of water and quench it from a molten condition it'll form little wh white globules as it expands and stuff as it uh, is quenched so it's called water white rosin Mil many of your military specifications require that you use um, a chloride free um, rosin bath uh, wa water white rosin you can have what they call well, actually might as well go back a little bit if you go to specifications for fluxes somewhere in here this is a handout that you have on solders and soldering um, here we go so here's a, a little table it's hard to read at the top various metals if you want to solder to platinum gold copper silver 
tin plate, solder plate. These are easy to solder. You can use rosin fluxes, non-activated, no hydrochloric acid. Because these things don't have heavy oxides if the copper's freshly cleaned. And these other things, you basically just melt the surface so you get rid of any oxides. Mildly activated, so if the copper's tarnished a little bit more. Um, so inactivated is, this is mildly activated is a little bit of chloride and then uh, uh, activated is a fair amount of chlorides mixed in with the, the rosin. Um, turns out lead, nickel, brass, bronze, rhodium, these are less easy to solder. Why would brass be more difficult to solder than copper? What's the difference copper and brass? It's got, brass has got zinc. Turns out zinc oxide is more stable than copper oxide. And so a betic acid doesn't work very well unless you put a lot of chlorine in there, then you form zinc chlorides. And in fact, zinc chloride fluxes are great fluxes in and of themselves for soldering. Um, you get down here to stainless steels and aluminum and bronzes, and you find it's getting hard to solder these things. Very difficult to solder. You're going to have to use um, pre-coating if you're going to do uh, wave soldering of stainless steel on some cir circuit board, which we don't usually do. Or uh, pre-coating could be you could uh, tin plate the chromium uh, or the stainless steel. Or you're going to have to um, uh, use a zinc chloride flux, which is, I'm going to show you why it's so corrosive. The aluminum bronzes have an aluminum oxide coating, very difficult to solder to, and I'll show you something about that. Beryllium and titanium, they're just not solderable. Below 450C, you don't have enough temperature to break down the titanium oxide or the beryllium oxide. So you can throw zirconium in here. Uh, a lot of your refractory metals with very stable oxides just can't solder them because below 450, some things you just can't get rid of that oxide very easily. Yes? So when you solder something, you don't actually correctly use, you, know, you don't use the flux correctly, you just kind of, you solder like, you know, like a sixth grader would, you just yep. drop, dump a drop of solder on, and it sticks a little bit, but it's going to break off. Is that just a temporary mechanical analog? Sure, it, yes, mechanical analog. It's basically an adhesive bond, and if you flick it with your fingernail, it's liable to fall off. Yeah. Okay, but it won't have a good contact angle either. Okay, you can tell by just a simple inspection. In fact, they have automatic solder inspection systems, which are vision systems, and they're all they're doing is looking for the contact angle. Okay, they've got an image analysis software, and or they'll come in with a laser light, and they'll look look how the laser a, la a line of laser light, how it what's the profile of that solder joint. If it doesn't show a good low contact angle you automatically reject it. So there are automated inspection systems, and I'll show you why in a little bit, why you need those. Uh, so some things are not solderable. It turns out there is a way to solder aluminum, and it's called a reaction flux, which is a terrible name, because it doesn't react. That's the point, okay, of how it works. Uh, the, the other ones are you can have chemical dissolution, which is a betic acid. You're dissolving the copper oxide in the rosin, okay? It becomes copper abetic. Okay, you can have chemical reduction, so you can use hydrogen or chlorides, and you're basically forming uh, copper chlorides or, or uh, uh, reducing the hydrogen, or the hydrogen takes the oxygen off the, uh, off the copper and leaves uh, metallic copper. A reaction uh, flux for aluminum is tin chloride or zinc chloride, and essentially what happens as you heat up the aluminum oxide, it will actually break up the surface because the difference of coefficient of expansion between the aluminum oxide surface and the aluminum underneath. Now, if you do that with regular aluminum in the air, you know, we got the Langmuir 10 to the minus 8 atmosphere seconds, and you just fill in those cracks uh, and grow the oxide back. But if you've got a flux of tin chloride or aluminum chloride, you actually get a chemical reaction, and I've just written it for tin here. The tin replaces the aluminum to form aluminum tr chloride gas. Aluminum tr trichloride is a gas, and it deposits tin metal. So now I'm soldering a tinned silver, and these little islands of aluminum oxide float away on the, on the solder bath. 
So if you now have, you have the flux that keeps the air from reforming and bridging aluminum oxide, cracks up the aluminum oxide, uh, you have some solder come, come in here and the aluminum oxide floats away and you end up with a solder joint. The problem is tin chloride and zinc chloride are extremely hydroscopic. If you leave this solder out for four hours in Cambridge, exposed to the air, or not the solder, but the flux, it's no longer any good. It will pick up enough moisture for the air that the tin reacts with the moisture to form tin oxide and water, okay, or in hydrochloric acid, I guess. Um, so tin oxide and hydrochloric acid, you no longer have any fluxing capability. You just destroyed your tin, tin chloride or your zinc chloride, okay. So um, I once um, soldered up something, some aluminum for a, a demonstration back when I was an assistant professor this a few years ago, before you were born. And I, I got some of this aluminum soldering flux and everything worked great until, uh, and I went and did my little demonstration in class on slip planes, it had to do with deformation and stuff. And the next year I took it off the shelf and it just fell apart in my hands. Because I hadn't, I had some blind joints and I'd left some of the flux on the inside, air got on the inside, attacked this, the solder flux that was the residue and just corroded the joint within a year. So I had to redo it and make it out of steel and weld it up. Anyway, it was a mess. And now it weighs a ton when I'm trying to do the demonstration for the students. Actually, I haven't done it for 30 years because it does weigh a ton. But nonetheless, <coughs> um, there is a reason why chlorides are so harmful for soldering. And I guess I can write it on the board, but I thought I had something here that actually gave you the formula. Uh, I guess I'll just write it on the board. Well, actually I can show you this. There is an International Institute of Welding classification for soldering fluxes. So we've got, and they call it resin type flux, which is actually rosin, or you can have a, a synthetic resin. It can be organic, water soluble, or not water soluble. It can be not activated, means no, no halogens. It doesn't have to be chlorine. It could be fluorine, it could be bromine. Uh, we don't usually uh, use iodine for other reasons. Uh, and then three is not halogen activated. There are ways to activate fluxes with organics that will reduce the copper oxide. And the flux form can be uh, liquid, solid, or paste. Um, so there's a classification here. And you can specify a type one flux 2,3A. Okay, so it would be a liquid uh, not halogen activated resin type, okay? Uh, is there a question? Anyway, but let me show you what happens and unfortunately this is not quite as intuitive as it used to be for students. It used to be intuitive because if you ever did any maintenance on your car battery you would see this white deposit that forms on the lead terminals of your car battery. Except now I can hear this. I guess I'll have to write it down for you. Okay. If you form, well you have some lead oxide on the terminals of your, your car battery and this used to be the old types of unsafe terminals that you had a little post of lead sticking up and you had a clamp and you just clamped to it. Now we actually have a stainless steel screw cast into the lead terminal and you just tighten the screw up against the flat piece of lead. You can get the same thing but they actually have rubber boots and stuff to keep the moisture out and I'll show you why you want to keep 
the moisture out. If you have some chlorides, such as road salt, that will form a lead chloride plus water. That lead chloride will react with the CO2 and moisture in the air to form a lead carbonate that's a two up here and it regenerates the hydrochloric acid so this thing just runs around in a circle this chemical reaction spinning off lead carbonate it's not lead oxide that forms on, it is lead oxide that forms on your terminals but if you have any chlorides left over such as New England road salts that splash up onto your lead battery in your engine compartment you will actually form this white lead carbonate growing at the anode corrosion occurs at the anode so your positive terminal will grow this white scum and you can go to a auto parts store and they'll sell you these little jellies that you can put on there that will essentially dissolve the lead carbonate. Essentially you're, you're, uh, you're doing something that's trying to tie up the chloride but if you can keep the chloride away you don't have a problem. Well now you can see why if you don't clean off your flux residue or you use a halogen activated uh, flux and you don't clean it off completely very small amounts of chlorine just lead to corrosion in the air. And in fact, if you're talking about very small solder joints, such as you have on some sort of printed circuit board where your joints are very small, it doesn't take more than a year's worth of corrosion because the joints are so thin and so small, and all of a sudden you've corroded away your joint. So a significant problem in making circuit boards is a way to encapsulate the, the semiconductor and those joints to keep the moisture out, okay? You'd love to run them in a vacuum, but that's not very economical to run your cell phone in a vacuum. Okay, although a lot of it go what goes into the cell phone. Oh no, that's never. Okay, that's another problem. <coughs> uh, let me show you another kind of. I told you that no one has really come up with a solution for. They want to get the lead out of solder because they've decided that children are growing up stupid in this country because they've been because there's lead contamination everywhere. I don't think that's why they're growing up stupid. I think it's genetic. Their parents were stupid and they are stupid. But anyway, um, anyway, so if you look at, this is tin solders. Tin lead, tin silver, tin indium, tin bismuth. This is the excess temperature for tin-based solders for the spreading ratio. So this is how much it flows. For lead tin, you have to have an excess temperature of about, um, what's going on here? That's a funny scale. Uh, anyway, yeah, of about 10 degrees centigrade. It'll spread out a factor of 10 over its original area if you give it 10 degrees centigrade above 183C if we're talking the eutectic solder. Tin silver, that's a little bit pricey, but you've got to have three times that. Tin indium, you've got to have a 50 to 75 degree excess temperature. Even though tin indium melts at like 156 degrees centigrade, you've got to get up to 225C before it really starts to flow. This really gets back to some of these, uh, these activities that I just erased, okay? The spreading activity, the chemical reaction of these other things is not as anywhere near as good as lead tin. And if you look, these are indium base. Indium base solders all have high superheats, if you will. If you look at lead base, well, here's lead tin. And even the other lead base solders are nowhere near as good as lead tin. If you look at bismuth base, okay, um, or if you look at silver base, silver tin and lead tin are the two that flow close to the melting point without too much superheat. And that means if I'm doing wave soldering or anything like that, they're much better. Now, a lot of people 
when they first started looking for lead-free solders, looked at bismuth alloys, okay? And I remember going to, there was, there was $100 million a year being spent on coming up with t uh, tin bismuth or um, primary tin bismuth. And t bismuth was cheaper than lead, okay? Does anyone have an, any idea why bismuth, by a, a choice of bismuth tin would be such a terrible choice? Because it would destroy the recyclability of a billion tons of steel each year. It turns out you can get lead out of steel. You can oxidize it out when you remelt the steel. You cannot get bismuth out of steel. And bismuth goes to the grain boundaries of the steel. Where, do, where does the majority, or not the majority, actually probably the largest single fraction, not the majority, of steel recycling come from? Automobiles. And there are electrical solder joints in automobiles. And, if, and these people wanted to get the lead out of automobiles by, well, they've never replaced the lead acid battery. That's another thing we can talk about. We're still using lead acid batteries, but that's sort of localized and you can unbolt it and send that to the battery uh, recycling center. But solder joints, they're all through the car. You're gonna have someone go in there and take out all the solder joints in the car before you try to recycle it? It costs a fortune to recycle it. There is no way that we have in the way we make steel today that can take out lead or bismuth contamination. You can't oxidize it out. You oxidize out the iron before you oxidize out the bismuth. Okay? Iron oxide is much more stable than in a lead bath and a little bit of bismuth oxide. So I used to look at this and roll my eyes and say, these people don't understand the system's implications of what they're trying to do. So it turns out, I think nowadays in the last 10 years, a lot of people have figured that out. And the system that most people are using are not even these systems. Um, they have, well, they actually tend to be tin anemone systems, which are not even on here. Where's my tin systems? My tin systems. Okay, they don't, they don't even list tin anemone. Now they first got the lead out of plumbing, I think it was like 1978, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts changed the plumbing code and you could not use lead-based solders in your plumbing for your household potable water. And they had to go to, they first went to tin silver and you can see why they did. And it was pricey, but it's only 5% silver. And silver wasn't quite as expensive back then as, as it is now. But um, they then went to tin anemone, which has got like anywhere from three to 10%. And some of them are tin anemone copper. You put a little copper in there, raises the melting point a little bit, but anyway. Um, so tin anemone, um, but there's a problem with that. If you talk to a plumber, and soldering, remember, is not just the way we make electrical connections, it's the way we make plumbing joints. And lead tin was wonderful because if I had a gap between one thousandths and four thousandths on that clearance, gap clearance, the lead would fill it. It flows in very well into a very thin joint. It also will bridge the gap of a four thousandths or five thousandths inch joint. 10,000 cents joint, no, it's just gonna all flow away. Forget it, you got a problem. But up to one to four thousandths gap on the radius, it will f flow in and it will stay there until it solidifies and you end up with a solid joint. And so it used to, you talk to nowadays an old plumber because, uh, but when they used to plumb up the system, they would then fill it up with air or with water and they go and they do a leak check. And if it's lead tin system, you never had a leak or if you had a leak, it was one out of 200 joints. With the tin silver or tin anemone type solders they use today, tin is very fluid. It's great on a 1,000 thick joint, but typically these things have, you know, if you're just talking about a copper pipe going into a copper elbow that's deformed to shape it and form it, they've easily got 4,000 clearance in terms of normal process manufacturing variation. And when they solder up the whole system, they go do the leak check, they may have 10% leaks, which they gotta go back and fix, but it adds a cost, okay, to that whole thing. And so back in the 1980s, the plumbers were just cursing this 
this requirement that you get lead, rid of lead tin solder because lead tin had some very, very nice properties. Okay. Um, I'm, this, some of this is just sort of catching up a number of different topics uh, here on solders. We're going to get into tomorrow, I will be lecturing and, and we'll get into uh, electronic packaging and stuff. But this is something which, this is a general principle, not just, uh, oops, no. uh, what it costs to do repairs at different stages of the manufacturing process. And note this repair cost is on a log scale. So if you're doing pre-solder visual testing, you're looking to see if the solder all got placed where it's supposed to be before you put it into the wave solder or the furnace or whatever that's going to melt the solder. And it doesn't cost you much to spot where you forgot to put the solder before you make the joint. If you are now doing a post-solder inspection, the price goes up by more than a factor of 10. It costs about 10 bucks to find the bad joint on the circuit board, repair it, okay? Systems testing, if you now put this all into some, you know, some bigger something or other, whether it's the size of a bread box or whether it's the size of a, a uh, relay rack, you're now talking something on the order of $50 you might find the circuit, you gotta pull it out of the rack, you gotta reassemble it, and so now the price goes up. If you do it as a field repair, it might cost you three, four hundred dollars to send a technician out there to find it and hand solder it, okay? But this is not just soldering, this is just in general. You talk about virtually any type of manufactured product. If you catch the defects early on, it's about, in order of magnitude difference at each one of these steps. So uh, <clears throat> what people learned is quality control is important. And I guess the last thing I'll do before <coughs> we go, I need to give you that, we can talk about it in a little bit. Um, before we, before I, rather than going into something new, um, let me just tell you a story about um, pagers. Back around 1990, pagers, the pager business, there had been pagers back in the 1980s, but that business initially of pagers got sent to uh, Asia. But in 1990 or so, 1989, Motorola was very innovative. Down in Boynton Beach, Florida, they decided to bring the pagers back to manufacture them, assemble them in the United States. It turns out today, I'm sure pagers, this is all done on software on a chip, but chips weren't as powerful back then, they weren't as inexpensive uh, 25 years ago. And there were like four or five components, because every pager has to have a different frequency that's being paged, right? So there are like four or five different components, and if you ordered a pager in the United States, it would be six weeks in 1988 for you to get your pager, because they'd have to send the order to Asia, have the thing go in line for production, be produced, ship back in six weeks before you get your pager. Motorola decided that they could have a plant in Florida that might cost more to assemble, but they could get the pager to you within three to five days of ordering, because you didn't have to do all this stuff across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and they were going to, they streamlined their billing procedure so that if you, if you order, the order went immediately to Chicago and then the, from Chicago it went immediately by computer to Boynton Beach and got in line for production within a very short time. Plus they built an automated assembly line that took a lot of the handwork that they were doing in Asia. And so this whole thing was automated. It was assembly line, I saw it wasn't much bigger, maybe twice the size of this room. Okay, it wasn't all that expensive. And so they brought the pagers back and they had this competitive advantage that they could get you your pager within a week rather than six weeks. Well, it turns out there was another significant advantage to the guy at Motorola who had conceived of all of this. He said, we will not have a rework area. Okay, so I told you the post-solder repair the rule of thumb in the industry was 
of your product had to be reworked. And he said, I'm not gonna build a room to do rework. If it doesn't work, we throw it out. And people said, you're gonna, you're gonna kill your profitability. He says, nope, we're gonna fix the problems before they show up. And uh, so they didn't build it, and everybody said he was gonna, it was gonna be a disaster. It turns out they fixed the problems and they had almost no rework. And so this rule of thumb in the industry, if you always build in 6% rework, that was what was determining the 6% rework. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. People, they had engineers who would fix the process until they got to 6% and the rework area wasn't overloaded. And then they would quit fixing that process and go on to some other fire. But when they had no rework area, they would keep on fixing the process. And this is when they first started talking about Six Sigma quality control and things. But I'll tell you the exact same thing happened in a Ford plant. A Ford Mustang plant. Turns out at the end of the line of assembling the vehicles, they filled them up with, they were filled up with gas and a guy was supposed to get in there, turn the key and drive it out to the lot to be loaded onto the railroad cars, et cetera. If the car didn't start when he turned the key, they had a, a little tow motor uh, vehicle come and pull the car out to the repair area to figure out why the engine wouldn't start. New plant manager came in and says, no more tow motors. They said, what do you mean? He said, if it doesn't start, you push it all 250 yards to the repair area. Well, you want to know something? The guys who had to push the cars made sure those engineers made sure that the car started every time. And all of a sudden, they were all starting. So once they gave them the proper incentive, <coughs> either push it or start it, okay, the problems went away. So anyway, so it, it works not just in soldering but in Ford Mustangs. So see you tomorrow. <laughs>